Thank you, Regina, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Laying the Foundation for Effective Chemical Management. I'm Ed Rutkowski, Editor-in-Chief of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all of our listeners for attending today's event, and especially SiteHawk for sponsoring this webinar. SiteHawk is the global leader in safety, data sheet, and chemical data management, providing long-term compliance solutions through its market-leading cloud-based technology and world-class professional services. Our presenter today is Matt Adams, Senior Solutions Engineer at SiteHawk. Matt is a thought leader in the EHSQ space. He has experience in the field as a safety officer and at the solution development level as a product consultant. He holds a degree in environmental engineering from the University of Guelph. Now, Matt, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Ed. So I'm just going to take the ball here and share my screen, and we should be off to the races. All right. So, sharing. All right, so we should be able to see our kind of title slide here, but thank you, Ed and Regina, for setting everything up and with the intro. Uh, but yeah, as Ed mentioned, my name is Matt Adams, and I'm a senior solution engineer here at SiteHawk. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much on me, and we'll use as much time as we can to kind of dive into um, building your foundation or laying the foundation uh, for effective chemical management. Uh, what we can expect today is a little bit of something for everybody. Uh, we're going to try to start really at the, the base level with your kind of laying the foundation reference there uh, to set you up for success, um, just managing what you have on site, what you might be using in your production processes, and all the different substances that uh, employees could potentially be exposed to on a on day-to-day -day operation. Uh, so we'll do a, a quick kind of EHS, environmental health and safety, product stewardship, um, how we care in reference to chemicals. Then we'll look at actually knowing what we have on site. Uh, the first step to kind of mitigating your risk and understanding your, your risk profile will be knowing what's actually on site. And then as we go forward, we'll look at some, some proactive ways that we can maintain that, make some good decisions. And uh, as we tail, as in the tail end there, We'll uh, finish it up with what else is possible. How, what are the ripple effects of chemical management and the rest of the business? And we'll just touch on all these items. I mean, we could do a webinar on each and every one or a full day on each and every one. We'll try to keep it light. Uh, throughout, there will be a couple poll questions to keep everyone involved. Uh, we'll probably have one of those about every 10 minutes or so. And uh, we'll be able to discuss your answers as well, so keep a lookout for those. And Tina, could I get a clock or something just so I know where I'm at with my time? Perfect. All right. So we'll kick it off with our kind of why do we care? And you'll see a lot of your EHS, your AIHA webinars starting with this. But you have your environmental health and safety product stewardship. And uh, you could you can tell a lot, of, a lot of horror stories and a lot of uh, things that maybe didn't go so well when folks might not have been as proactive as as they could have been or maybe thought about things a little differently. Um, but in the news, you're actually seeing things come up uh, lately. Uh, really high profile one on the, more on the product stewardship side lately was the SC Johnson uh, asbestos in the baby powder. Uh, so somewhere in the, in the process downstream there, uh, we, we, we missed, there was a miss with the, the chemical management going on, the visibility and the, the right steps taken to ensure that um, our product was safe. And even on the, on the element uh, in the news where you have the Arkema folks that have actually been indicted. And they, they you could argue that they actually um, did what was safest, uh, but still they, they, they deem that they might have been able to take better proactive measures to, to keep that explosion from happening after, after Hurricane Harvey. Um, so why is it important? Uh, of course, there's that general, we want to uh, kind of keep the water we drink safe. We want to make sure that our products are safe for the folks that are using them and uh, make sure that we're um, keeping our employees as, as safe as possible as well and not exposing them to things that could hurt them down the road. Uh, but there's also the, the regulatory landscape. Um, so based on these requirements and basic kind of decency and needs around EHS, um, there's been regulations that have been developed at all different levels that will actually be specific to or touch on your chemical management. And 
as we speak about laying the foundations, um, the importance here is actually knowing uh, what your requirements are and compliance requirements are as a company. And this can actually be a challenge if you're moving into this area for the first time or you come specifically from the environmental side or a siloed area like your industrial hygiene um, to move up with that, that larger view. Um, but a great way to do this is, is speak to champions in kind of each space. So say you're the industrial hygienist and you're tasked with your chemical management plan. You might want to speak to your environmental engineer or your, your safety officers at sites to understand the, the different items that you're required to follow at the, the federal, the state level, uh, all the way down to um, particular sensitive regions. And then not to forget your end customers. Uh, we actually have a lot of customers um, who will have to manage products differently based on who they service. Uh, you can take the auto industry, for example. You might have a, a tier one supplier that supplies many components for a, a finished vehicle from one of the major auto brands. Uh, those ma major auto brands will actually give them a list of chemicals they do not want going into their products or coming on their site uh, when they're doing work. Um, I'll use a kind of quick example here just to keep things relevant for things that might affect a lot of those folks on the on the phone listening in here. Um, but a good one would be OSHA HASCOM. So just ensuring that you have your kind of an understanding of everything that's on site and everyone that could be potentially exposed to one of those materials on site has access to the uh, to an up-to-date safety data sheet and knows where to get at that. So just kind of in, in summary here, you have your your foundations and why we care is you have your basic decency around environmental health and safety, product stewardship, you want to do good for the world, right? And then you have the, the regulatory bodies that have actually put specific rules down uh, that you want to be able to, to follow and uh, make sure that you protect your brand, keep your company, uh, make sure they're not at risk as well. And that's actually going to lead us to, uh, to our first question here. Um, and Regina, um, feel free to, to start the poll. But the first question is, how important is EHS and product stewardship at the management level of your company? And, and what you'll find is, speaking about the why is it important, uh, things are going to be a lot easier to push through when they have that management support from above. And, and something we see um, from a day-to-day -day basis is um, somebody might really want to put a new system in place or make a change from how things are done on the day-to-day, -day, uh, but they may just be told it's not a priority. And that might not be kind of, you might not want to be looking at, well, what's the cost to us? You might be wanting to looking at, you know, how does this affect our brand if we don't do it properly? Or how does this affect people um, coming in and out and how they feel as someone who's one of our employees on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so I think we have about five seconds, that little window there on your right, and we should be able to see the results, I think it takes about 20 seconds to kind of tally up here, and then it'll show us. Um, on this one, this is good because it's a good foundational question to kind of uh, look at before we dive into some best practices about figuring out actually what's on site and how we might want to handle that. And I'm also going to pop up our our chat window to see if I see any questions I should take proactively here. All right, so it looks like our results are back. Uh, they should be in that same window that um, you had before. And what we see is this is actually a, a phenomenal. Um, we have 43% of those that are on here um, in the extremely important area. That's really promising. Um, so that, and it kind of, there's, there's not even a bell curve here. You have 38% uh, after that in the very important column. Then just a, a few folks that are in the not important at all or, or somewhat important. So um, that actually speaks to the attendees of webinars like this that are being proactive and, and going out there and spending the time, so it's perfect. If we pay attention to the, the next thing, especially those folks that want to kind of shine a light on the positive effects of kind of EHS and investing in your product stewardship and the way that you handle your policies. Um, right now, we're actually at a unique time. Uh, over the past 
decade or so as I've been involved in the AHS, uh, there, there has been more and more of a shift to an importance of kind of your, your safety record and if you're, you're a good corporate citizen and how you're, how you're looking at the long-term effects of people doing business with you. Uh, currently, you actually have uh, an area where we see so much in the news about social media. You see uh, all this brand awareness out there. You can think about some of the, the things that I even referenced at the beginning of the presentation, the SC Johnson or the Arkema um, explosion story. I mean, brand reputation and people knowing about what your brand is doing is everywhere today. And then something unique we've had in the United States, if you're a US-based company, is you do have the corporate tax changes. Um, so that's something that uh, your company may be able to realize a little more revenue than usual and what better time than to look at an investment in the future, um, something that could really become a competitive advantage as opposed to a cost center in EHS, prepare yourself uh, down the road as other companies are going to be investing in their, their brand protection, uh, their environmental health and safety product stewardship. Uh, one other thing I could have actually put in here is probably your, uh, your actual employment. Right now, people are battling it. Unemployment is that lowest it's been in a very long time. And you're actually having to attract employees. If you have folks that are they're working in dangerous conditions or coming home with a, a really bad cough because they're exposed to something, that, they, they have options to other places they could go. Um, so this is actually affecting your bottom line. So we're gonna move from the kind of high level view as to why it's important to what we actually have on site. A visibility is so important and it's a starting point. And it's amazing too. I mean, one of one portion of SiteHawk's business is actually doing physical inventories, and you'd be surprised at the type of clients that actually have no idea what they have on site, whether they're a, a public entity or, or nuclear sites. You, you have some people doing some pretty dangerous stuff uh, that that are still trying to get a hold of this kind of thing. Um, so we'll start with some basic foundation, a safety data sheet. That's really important. That's going to be your your kind of true source of safety data in North America that you'll be referencing. Just as a, a definition, it, every, every substance has one, even substance you might not expect, like batteries or solders or, or tapes and all other adhesives. And then just what is a chemical inventory? So a lot of folks, when they think inventory, they think um, of a store type inventory. So I have five bottles of X and I have 25 chocolate bars. Uh, chemical inventory is, is fairly broad, so it's all of your substances or chemicals you have on site, and it can be just what those are, so what I have on site, not, not necessarily the quantities, right down to kind of what I have and exactly what area they're in, or even down to that point where I, ha I know I will have exactly 15 gallons of substance A and I have three boxes of substance B. So it is a, a little more broad in that sense. When you're actually getting your inventory together, what you'll, what you'll accomplish is visibility. So with that visibility, you now know what is actually on site. Uh, before you have that visibility, you are a lot of times taking some educated guesses for things like compliance or rolling the dice a little bit. Um, and who knows, if you don't have a, something on site, if you don't know you have something on site or how you're using it, could that potentially be getting into your end product or could your employees that are on the road performing a service potentially be exposed to that over time? How do you have a record of it? Um, so once you have that, you can develop your communication strategy. So how am I going to actually acquire all these safety data sheets and make them, make them available to my employees? And you'll also be able to do all, a lot of your reporting. Um, I'll give you an example. The, the EPA requires something called a Tier 2 report, which is requires companies to kind of cross-reference what they have on site against a list of um, some really nasty substances and report on them if they have above a certain threshold. It's tough to do that when you, you can't see what's there. And then the, third, the last thing is just general decision-making. Uh, when you're changing a process or looking at getting into a different, uh, an expanding the lines of business that you're in, uh, you might want to know what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis to see if they're going to gel with what the future plans are. So something to think about there 
And then the inventory itself, so kind of getting into a, more of a tactical mode. Uh, so say I, I'm not really sure what I have on site and how, how I, I don't know exactly how I, I want to go about that. Um, it's really great to kind of do a corner to corner inventory at some point every year or so because things inevitably slip through the cracks. And say you don't have an inventory set up at all, some things that you're going to want to look for is you're going to want to look for the product name, the manufacturer, and that actual product code so you can go out and acquire the actual SDS. And there's some different ways to do this. There are companies out there, SiteHawk being one of them, that will actually come on site and they specialize in this. Uh, but it can be, it can be pretty daunting. Uh, I mean, there are facilities that have thousands of chemicals, and doing a proper inventory, we find you might only be able to get through about 250 a day if it's something that you're doing often. So you can think if you have a smaller EHS team, uh, that might be a pretty hefty time commitment. And with inventories as well, uh, something that comes up consistently with folks that are, are working to get their hands around what they have on site is the underestimate of what's actually there. Uh, it's amazing. We have a, a lady here that's been doing inventories for, for years and years, a long time, actually before I, I got into EHS at all. Uh, her name is Kim Williams, and what she said to me, was uh, it kind of blew my mind, and she said probably 25% of the time that we do an on-site inventory, we find a room or an area that contains substances that our client who hired us had no idea existed. I mean, that's kind of crazy. So us doing hundreds of different facility inventories a year, that means there are, are dozens of sites that had rooms with chemicals in them, things that could potentially be dangerous, that they didn't even know about. Um, so even a, a looking at a plant diagram and planning out an inventory, important before you get started. Uh, I'll tell one particular story uh, that gives an example of uh, the kind of risk that can be out there if, if we don't get ahead of this kind of thing. And that'll be, um, we were doing an inventory a few years back and it was a mining site. And this mining site had uh, a, I guess they had some R&D, some a lab where they're doing some research and development operations. And in that lab, um, or at the time, that lab was actually shut down because there was some merger and acquisition and they moved the research and development to another area. So that building wasn't actually shut down appropriately. And of course, when uh, we went to do the inventory, we said kind of, we have to go in each area because each area is subject to all your different regulations. You want to have a good profile for the entire site. So our pros went into the area and we actually found a jar of something called picric acid, uh, which I didn't know what that was or the, really the implications of that when I was told the story, but it was a jar of picric, picric acid just sitting there open. And this is actually a substance that's classified once it's dried out or once it's only 30% um, wet, I believe. I'm sure some expert in chemicals will correct me in the comments. Um, it becomes a an explosive solid. Uh, so I'll give you an example. I, I just did a quick Google news search and this is what popped up. So hazmat team and Bob squad called in deal with picric acid scare. So a woman came to dispose of a, a vial of picric acid that had about 50 milliliters of picric acid in it, and they had to call the bomb squad. And they basically said that if that was jarred the wrong way and since it had started to crystallize, it could have caused an explosion that could have taken out the entire room and all the people in it. So that's some pretty nasty stuff. And I mean, as a head of EHS or someone that's a plant manager, uh, you just might not be able to get into the tactical details of exactly what every single substance is, especially if you're coming in late. Um, so it's tough to know what every single one of these things can do. Uh, that's why an important, but in the chemical inventory, having visibility is so important. You can just imagine if someone went to shut down that building eventually, grab that jar of picric acid and toss it in a bag, and it, it broke or it, it was enough to jar it and make it explode. You could have a, a pretty nasty uh, situation on your hands. So that's going to lead us into some more kind of inventory 
best practices. And we'll ask a general question, just how granular should my inventory be? Uh, we see all sorts of different business types and different folks who have to, to maintain what they're doing. Uh, so different granularities of inventory is important. For example, if you have a distribution center and you don't necessarily deal with a lot of different materials, you might have your forklift batteries and your vehicle maintenance items and your cleaning supplies, it, it could be perfectly fine to have a facility level inventory. So just everyone has access to a generic um, workstation computer that has a link to an electronic system and they can just search for what they're looking for and pull out that SDS. That could be okay. Uh, however, if you're, manu if you're a chemicals manufacturer, you probably want to go a little bit deeper. It might be a little more appropriate to have an inventory that goes down to the chemical area level. So I know that I have assembly line B or my chemical tank line H and on that tank line, I have flammable cabinet 304. And I might not need the exact quantities of items, but I definitely want to know where those are and where they should be so I can uh, perform my due diligence a little differently in different areas. Um, those of you in this crowd, on the industrial hygiene side, um, you might be familiar with nailing things down right to the process. So, okay, we're going to do a full review of an actual work procedure. At, with each step in that procedure, how are folks interacting with substances and what kind of controls do we have to, to put around that to ensure that they're doing things um, where they're not going to harm themselves or others? And also, could I potentially even sub something out um, to make that a little safer? This all leads to our, our second poll question of the day. And this one's usually very telling um, about, the, about the audience that I like. But to what granularity do you currently track your chemical inventory? Uh, so Regina, if you want to pull the poll up, thank you very much. Again, the, the window should have popped up on all our screens. Uh, I'll actually describe what each one of these means. So we have A, organization level. So I have a single either binder that's the exact same and it goes to every single one of my sites, or that I have the same software program that's hosted online, uh, like say your SiteHawk communicator, and I have one version of it and everyone gets the same thing and they search that for whatever they need. B, facility level. So okay, I have three different locations. They all have access to a software program or a way to get to their safety data sheets. Um, but those are specific per facility. So if something's used in facility one, um, it won't be in facility two's binder. Deeper would be the actual area level at each facility. Um, so what area are our chemicals in? And the last one, container level. So I have five gallons of chemical A and I have a rail car of chemical B. Um, e would be that it's kind of a site-by-site -site basis. So maybe you at your level, you might be maybe the VP of EHS, and you have 10 distribution centers that keep it at the facility level, and then your five production facilities um, all go right down to the container level where it's sensitive and the chemical area level everywhere else. So we've got a couple minutes here because you might have to think about it or you might want to ask somebody, or you might want to even open up your system and check if it's bookmarked there. Um, but this question is a really telling one because uh, it can also, if you don't know, you, you can also make good decisions here. You know, you know, you can say, you know what, we're at the organization level, but I look at my operations here, we should really know what exactly what's on this site as opposed to what absolutely everyone has. So just to, to recap so far, we've done our, our why do we care? I mean, there's the for the good of mankind is our kind of first slide we started. And then uh, we talked about for the, the regulatory, for the good of our jobs in some cases. And then we went on to the first step of actually getting an inventory done, some of the ins and outs of that. And um, what you can do once you have that inventory, inventory established. So this is the kind of, the kind of bell curve that, that's fairly common. And actually this is, 25% of you are at the chemical area level, which is actually a little more than we generally see. A lot of times we'll see a heavy percentage of folks in, in that facility level. Uh, that might be because since we're hosting this through AIHA, 
you do get the folks in the, on the industrial hygiene side a lot who really care what part of a plant something's in. That becomes very important to yourselves. So that's perfect. This is really good to know. Um, those of you that are at the, the organization level, maybe in the services industry, right, where you have an organization that has five or six depots that, that trucks move in and out of, and yet you, you buy from a central buyer. Um, so from a ROI perspective and a time to benefit perspective, that's the right solution for you. All right, perfect. I'm going to close this and we're going we're gonna to dive in. I'm looking at my time here and uh, I, I seem to have been rambling a little bit. I think I might be a little, a little behind. So how can we maintain that visibility and inventory accuracy over time? Um, so there's huge benefits to being proactive. Once we have that actual visibility, maintaining your inventory is really important. Um, even maintaining what's already there. So maybe not what is coming in and going out, but we already have. Things like uh, verifying your safe data sheets. We have some companies that will call an intern in every year, have them go through all of their safe data sheets and call the manufacturer. You'd also outsource that. So for example, if you're using SiteHawk, we will actually perform a service similar to that for you and handle all of your updates. Then all of your history and version management. You have your OSHA 30 year rule in the United States. You need to keep a history of everything that's going on. Um, if that means you're taking the old SDS out and putting that in a drawer at the bottom of a file cabinet, you might want to ask yourself who's, who's grabbing that file cabinet in the case of a fire. Um, so there's different things you have to think about uh, when it comes to maintaining what's already there. Uh, then look at kind of what else is necessary. Now that we know what's on site, um, what kind of risk assessments do we have to do on these dangerous chemicals? And let's make sure we're, we're covering things end to end. Once we know what's on site again, a great thing to implement is an actual material approval process. And um, we'll be putting out actual materials in the future on the best practice of designing material approval. But something that's so important if you don't already have one is to match the kind of level of information that you'd like with the level of information the users will adopt and are willing to put in. You would probably love to have a hundred different individual questions answered about a material before it comes in. But in reality, is that engineer just going to bring something in and ignore it um, if they don't know what 50 of those questions are, if they don't have half a day to fill out that form? Uh, so it might good, be good just to start for some companies with a standard email or a standard three question material approval form uh, to begin with, just to get people in the, into the habit of letting people know when something new is coming on site. Uh, the enemy of many EHS supervisors is the fugitive material, where, where John or Sally needs, a, needs something that's a little more of an adhesive and goes down to Home Depot and buys it with a P card and brings it in the back door. Um, once you get that behavior change and established, you can naturally add more to that material approval. And maybe that's a check against a regulatory list like Tosca or your Tier 2s that might have more of a downstream in, impact. So there's tracking change with what's new and also tracking what's gone. Uh, no matter how great your proactive material approval process is, uh, there are things that you stop using, things that you can get rid of, and uh, things that might just slip through the cracks from time to time. Uh, for this, what we'll often recommend is, is regular inventories just to check up. Um, so a great way to do this, and there's a huge advantage. I saw a lot of you uh, handled inventory on a container level or a chemical area level. When you're at that level, something that's really nice is instead of doing an entire facility, you can do more of an inventory by committee. So you can actually dive in and, and give your team all different rooms or do different portions from time to time so you don't have to shut yourself down for a week to do an entire plant. So we can say, Joe is going to do chemical tank line B, and then Jennifer is going to do the maintenance area, and I'm going to take on the, the, general, the general storage and housing for supplies area. And that way, you each have a third of the work, and you're not going to have to take on a whole week, and you can consolidate that inventory at the end of the day. Um, a great way to do this, a lot of you I've noticed just going through the list are SiteHawk users, which is good but just by dividing things by chemical areas in SiteHawk and then exporting that list and bringing it back and making the changes, 
um, by, on an area level in Sitehawk, and you can even use a task management system, an EHS system, or whatever you use task management, to schedule those which repeat every, every six months or every year, uh, whatever is appropriate to yourself. So, kind of moving on here, I'm given, being given flash time signals in the room here to let me know where I'm at. Um, we're going to move from our chemical inventory, so why is this so important to set up and, and why do we need that visibility, over to our let's be proactive, let's maybe do an inventory by committee. Um, and actually, I'll give you an example on disposal there as well. We had folks do inventory by committee, and uh, I guess um, they what they did is they actually made um, their uh, downstream producer for um, railway companies. And they had, by the nature of their business, they had uh, a lot, had to store a massive amount of materials. And what they would do was develop these tiny kind of service sheds out in the yard. And over time, those service sheds would just accumulate materials. They were actually able to safely dispose of about half of their entire inventory uh, when they did chemical inventories and looked at each of those service sheds, which they hadn't done in about three years. Um, so just there, you can see kind of the, the savings um, by not having to update those and maintain those and report on them, and also getting rid of anything that might be expired or dangerous. And that's a really good segue into what else is possible. So we have our material approval process. We have now established some best practices to keep our inventories up to date. What can we really do that goes beyond compliance and starts to change, especially in the minds of management, change EHS and chemical management from a cost center into a cost saver or a competitive advantage? Um, so one of, the, one of the ones I love is diving into material properties. Uh, once you have a solid chemical inventory, uh, and especially if you've applied software to that, so say, for example, if, if you are using Sitehawk, what you can do is go into your material properties. So I can quickly run a report and say, all right, in my facility, I'd like a report on everything that could potentially, could potentially cause reproductive effects. Now I get a report that comes back and I see, okay, in our chemical lab, we have a bunch of items that could possibly cause reproductive effects. That's expected. Let's make sure that that's, hand, that's, in, that's handled in training. Then I've noticed in my maintenance area, I have two items that are, could potentially cause reproductive effects. What kind of training are we doing there? Well, and what are we using those items for? Can we substitute them? That's going to make for a safer workplace if we can do that. So material properties are a great way in running those reports, or just things like, give me everything with a flashpoint um, that's at a certain level, or anything with an NFPA rating of three or more. It's a great way to identify your riskiest items and where they are and start to mitigate those. So, so find out what you'll have the biggest bang for your buck and, and go through systematically and, and make some changes. Another one is, and this is actually kind of on your ripple effects of chemical management, can, come, can actually coincide a lot with your procurement team or your sourcing team. So vendor consolidation. We have organizations that they might be dispersed across North America they could take a look at a very basic substance that they all use in their manufacturing process, and they could find out that for 12 sites, they have 15 different vendors for the exact same product. You just imagine how much of that they go through and the type of bulk discount they can organize when they consolidate that down to three vendors and kind of can organize proper contracts with them. So running a vendor report that just says, tell me everything I'm getting and group them by vendor, or running a material report, say this is the material and this is the synonym of the material, show me all of these items and all the different vendors, can give you some great insight to go into your sourcing team and say, hey, we're, we're using this 15 times, we can probably buy it twice or three times a year, um, let's negotiate something and, and, and start to save some money here that we can eventually return back to our end customer. Uh, GHS is a hot topic, uh, especially with kind of OSHA 2012 or WIMIS 2015 now in Canada, we're always striving for that, that actual heavy GHS content. And what the GHS pushes for is to have everything actually up to date and on message in the right GHS format. When using the chemicals 
of your chemical inventory, either in a system or by noting it down yourself with whatever you're doing for your inventory, you can start to pull out those items that are not GHS compliant and either contacting the manufacturer for a proper document or subbing it out with something else and over time becoming more compliant because you're dealing with someone upstream who you know is putting a little more care into what they're developing. Uh, the last thing is just in general and all of the above speak about this, um, but with every single ISO 9001, 14001, your old OSAS 18001 or going to 45001, continuous improvement is such a core element to all those items. And continuous improvement is also a core element to any successful company out there. Doing things like this and tracking that push forward gives you fantastic metrics to, that you can go brag about and tell people about that inspires folks to just be a little more concerned and have their EHS and their chemical management and their industrial hygiene more top of mind when they're doing something. So we did kind of the things that are really specific to our chemical inventory, what can I do there with that information? Now let's go one step farther. So at this point, now where else do I use chemicals in my business? So I look at an EHS program and we might center ourselves in industrial hygiene or environmental compliance or safety and PPE depending on our specific role. But you take a broader look and I look at ISO 14001. Well, wow, my aspect and impact assessments, I actually do assessments based on the things that I'm releasing to the atmosphere while I'm taking on these actions. How can I incorporate chemical data in that area? Maybe that's as simple as talking to the folks that are doing that and making sure they know how to access and find the correct safe data sheet. Or if I'm using the system, let's integrate. Let's actually plug my chemical data directly into that aspects and impacts process in the other system. Another one is industrial hygiene itself. It's really difficult as an industrial hygienist, all the swivel chair type of work you have to do. So I have my industrial hygiene exposure assessment in Excel. I have my safety data sheets and my full material disclosures from companies in two different places that I have to go find, type in, or have somebody else type in. And then when I actually do the sampling, that lives in a different Excel sheet in a different share folder. Or maybe I have a system for one of those items and no system for the other three, or maybe I have a separate system for all three. When you start to tie those together with chemical data, and actually look at the business process, you can save not only hours and hours of time, but also you can prevent a lot of legwork and human data input where that might result in mistakes. And that's something, especially if you're a current SiteHawk customer, just give us a call and talk, talk about that. That's one of the things that we've done a lot over the last little while is actually looked at the different systems in your business and had those things start to talk together. Um, so it's going to save you a bunch of time and money. Uh, another one is any sort of purchasing systems, like we mentioned, or an ERP system. It's a great idea to actually have your substance ID or your location ID, whatever you might assign to every material coming in, speak back to your ERP system. That might be your SAP. That way, at the end of the day, you might not have to track the quantities for every single material, but you can run a quick report and say, all right, system, in my entire inventory, what should these chemicals match this regulatory list? And you can actually just export all the SAP IDs from those chemicals to pull in your quantities to decide if you have to report on them or make any changes in your business. All right, the last item is we'll do chemical specific. And this is probably great for those of you that answered that you're tracking things on the container level. Um, there are some systems that you're actually going to use for lab modeling. So I'm going to take a couple pure substances and I'm going to mix those things together to see what I'm looking at in the future. That system usually stands in its own area outside of the chemical management area. Are the people that are using that system, do they understand um, where that all that chemical data already is in your day to day? Or even better, if you're using something like SiteHawk and something like a, a SysPro to handle all of your your unified lab management, maybe you connect those right together. So in your chemical modeling, you actually pull in the data directly from your site hawk system or your chemical inventory system. Um, that really kind of, you get that one plus one equals three 
result there. So on this, we're actually going to look at a couple of live examples. The first one is actually the picture we're taking a look at. So we have a, a guy there um, in, his, in his welding gear that's welding something. So what I like to use here is a, a pretty good safety example. So you can have something like a JSA. A JSA is, is a job safety assessment. That's where you're going to break a job task down into easy to understand steps. So prepare my work area, gather my materials, um, turn on my torch, uh, perform the weld, shut off the torch, et cetera, and break it down by step to see what I'm doing, just so I can put any controls in place, make sure that people have the right goggles on, and look at the risk of that actual job that's being performed. So you might want to say, where does a guy's just welding? Where does a chemical come? Where's the chemical involved in there? But you think about it, you have the welding gas coming out of the torch. You have the two different metals together. If they're using lead solder on some some type of compound, is that going to be a problem? Uh, what about that? That the fumes that are coming off that is that different? If it's a solder that's more based out of a different metal, if it's more of a tin solder, right? And those are things you're going to want to think about. Not only that, you're just going to have employees that are referencing that JSA on an everyday basis. If you have though that chemical data right there in front of them attached to that JSA, that's going to make it top of mind. Maybe they're going to start asking questions or actually thinking about other jobs where they're dealing with chemicals, and they're going to, going to be thinking about doing things the right way. Uh, and again, this is something where even if you're using binders, you might just want to make people aware of it. But if you're using SiteHawk and maybe a, a system to do your JSAs, um, we can hook that oftentimes right into that system. So you can run the JSA and then right below your job steps and right below your risk, you have a link to the most current SDS and the health hazards pulled from the SDS right in front of you. So that's, a, that's, that's a great safety example. And then this isn't necessarily going to be an example, um, but you'd be shocked how often your, your processes, people will be using items that require an SDS, but they don't even realize it. So you, we're going to look at repainting a vehicle, standard operating procedure. I just pulled this online. I've never actually repainted a vehicle. If I did, I'm sure it wouldn't turn out so great. Um, but uh, this is a good example where you think of painting a vehicle, that like, yes, paint, that's some nasty stuff. We don't want to breathe in paint. But if you actually break it down, let's dive into the steps here. So on the left, you have wash in the car. Okay. Um, most people deal with soap quite often, but maybe you have some pretty nasty stuff on the car. That soap is, or whatever you're using to remove things is going to have an STS. You bring in the wax and grease removal. That grease remover, that wax, SCS. We're at, we're at three right now that you might want to look at. And what if you're kind of pushing those things all together? Do you know even sandpaper has your SCS as well? So you can go all the way through. And if you go through this, you could even, if you're doing different wax or grease removers, you can get up to 10 different chemicals that are potentially combining together that are all sitting somewhere on the same shelf that are all constantly changing in what the different health hazards on and what's in the make of them. Um, and it's something to consider. So it's interesting. You think paint, yes, absolutely paint is going to be important for, as a chemical and all the kind of air emissions coming off of that. Um, but you have a bunch of other items that are just below the surface. That brings us to our last question of the day. And that question is kind of based on your current chemical management program, which of the following would have the most impact? And this one, I'm really impressed with the answers to the first questions. You see the heavy management input into EHS, and you also see the, the granularity to which people are tracking and, and paying attention to their inventories. Uh, you can really understand that kind of the group here is, is motivated and fairly mature, um, which is great. Um, but just kind of tick box which one of these items stands out for you, you have a full two minutes. And as you do that, I'm actually going to dive in and, and read some of the comments that we have so far to see if we have any questions uh, that I should be preparing for to, that, are, that are maybe going to stump me or I'm going to need to ask Tina beside me to give me some feedback on mute here. All right, perfect. We have a couple. Let's 
good. All right, we have a couple that I'll be able to, to take in, absolutely. Uh, there's one that I just read here that, that I love because it, it goes much more into human behavior as, than it does chemical management. And um, with, especially kind of coming from the environmental engineering background, you get really technical and you automatically understand things, um, or not necessarily understand things, but you've been so close to them that you might have a different light on them. Um, so we're gonna dive into that. Uh, it looks like we have 30 seconds left in our question that should pop up in your, your window there. And then we'll be able to discuss those answers in a moment. But uh, specifically, the, the question that is pre-read is from uh, Cody Ushock. So we'll make sure we take that one. Can you like bookmark that for me, Tina, or like hold it so I don't lose it here as I sift through? All right. So it looks like we have stopped the polling question. It'll take a few seconds to jump in here. Uh, the more I look at this question, the more I um, realize I probably should have read the answers out instead of talking through it the whole time. Um, <laughs> and also, I, I, we might have wanted to make it a multi-select because there might be some good ones here. Um, with these answers, you'll, you'll notice that with all of these questions that we've asked, the way the answers line up, it almost tracks the maturity or the, pro the progress and, and how seriously uh, you all take uh, chemical management within your companies. And this one's uh, a good indicator as well. So you can see a, a bit of a, again, a little bit of a dip in number C, but you can see a, I wonder if I can expand this to see the whole thing. Uh, but a better idea of what's on site is kind of those that are on kind of on ground, not ground zero, but they might want to just have that better visibility to begin with. And then the folks that are looking at B, C, and D, um, kind of improving their process to know what's on site consistently, uh, getting a material approval process in place, and then just really increasing their ability to, uh, oh, sorry, Tina's got it from me, increasing their ability to pull the data. Those folks are really getting to the proactive space, and that's really good. And if you are using SiteHawk with those, you can feel free to call your, uh, your, your customer manager, and we can, we can certainly help you and provide you with extra stuff there. Then you see the, the folks that are on the end of that bell curve on the bottom. That's great because you're leaders in the industry of that. If you have are, are looking at kind of E and F, um, so really looking at your kind of using chemical data in other areas of your business particularly, uh, you're really tra trailblazing to the point where, where you're leading and probably using this as more of a competitive advantage than anything at this point, which is really great. Uh, so I'm gonna close this out. And I'm actually going to move to our question and answer. So a quick recap of what we did here um, after rounding out what else is possible. But in our QA, I have one up here, but Ed, how, how do you want me to do this? Should I just jump in or do you want to serve some up for me? I do want to take that one from Cody if, if I can. Oh, sure, Matt. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and read them out to uh, the, the whole audience. Before I do that, just to Quick explanation for our, our audience, if you want to ask a question, you'll need to uh, send it in the uh, chat module to the right of your screen, send it to all panelists. Um, if you haven't been on a Synergist webinar in a while, uh, you'll notice that the interface has changed a little bit uh, from what you may remember. And to, order, to open that chat window, uh, you'll have to click an icon towards the bottom of the screen, looks like a speech bubble. If you don't see that icon, just move your mouse down towards the bottom of the screen and it will appear. Um, but yes, let's get right to that question, Matt, uh, from Cody. And he asks, uh, getting buy-in from R&D lab custodians has not been easy at my site. Do you have any recommendations on getting buy-in? For example, performing their own inventories or removing expired or obsolete chemicals? All right, so that's, that's, I love this question. And first, I want to I want to cover myself. If your R and D lab custodians are unionized, uh, you might want to speak a bit to the the actual folks that handle the union um, in the first place, because they're they're very picky about what is in their job descriptions and um, what where their responsibilities start and end. Um, but for the the larger question, kind of, I'm going to break it down to um, something that 
might be a little bit more relatable to everybody. So not just R&D custodians, but say folks that um, with their day-to-day -day work procedures aren't handling chemicals in a way that there's reactions going on or in a way that they're going up in the air and they aren't central to what they do from day to day, it can be tough to get buy-in. Um, like I mentioned, um, or started to mention, my past is environmental engineering. So things like organic chemistry, understanding um, over time uh, how, what kind of effects chemicals and, and releases can have on, in the, on the air quality, on the water quality, um, just ecosystems in general. Uh, so when I think chemicals, my mind jumps to that right away. Uh, that's not the same as um, your general population. I mean, you go, I, I have some really, a house with white siding, and I, I look at the chemicals that are using, but I know the nastier chemical really cleans that siding a heck of a lot better than the green one. Uh, but I'll, I'm, I'm able to make that decision. When you talk about the R&D lab custodians here, uh, a good place to start might be just ensuring that they understand why it could be important to them. Uh, a great example is that story I gave with the picric acid. You can kind of show that picture, show the fire trucks there, and that there's actually a bomb squad called. I mean, it should never be there, uh, the sole responsibility of a custodian um, to be managing chemicals on site, to be honest. But when you dive into to get them to help out or take on a, a smaller piece it's for the greater good of the organization, uh, you'll really want to point out how it, it helps themselves and even find a way to either give support or show that, that just that thumbs up and that shout out to the folks that are doing it right so it has that positive feedback loop effect uh, going on as well. Uh, I'm happy, Cody, too, if you want to send an email and have a larger discussion to, to tell some other stories of how I've seen things go well with that challenge. Uh, but hopefully that's a, a, a bit of an overview of, of, and, a, and a helpful place to start. Okay. Uh, Matt, I have a, uh, not a question, but a comment from Joe um, and he, about the last poll question. He says, um, I think the reason there was a dip in response C to the last question is that attendees may have assumed an approval process was included in the inventory management system. I didn't know if you had a reaction to that. Oh, where's uh, where's that question? Can you just give me that one more time? I'm, oh, here we go. I think the reason there was a dip in response C, last question, assumed an approval process was included in the inventory management system. Ah, uh, okay. That is, you, you know what? That's a great that's a great comment, Joe. So Joe's saying that there was a dip in C, where, as, as I mentioned, you generally see a bell curve with that system. Um, so there's a dip in C because the attendees may have assumed that with an inventory management system, there is an approval process included. Um, and oftentimes there can be. Uh, we just find that so many organizations struggle with either user buy-in to an approval process so setting an approval process up that doesn't necessarily get used to the full extent or partially used, not used in the right way. And also organizations that will get an inventory done and will get a chemical management system up and running, but just the maintenance of that inventory and the, the mountain, the perceived mountain that had to be moved to get the inventory and the management system up in the first place, a momentum kind of fell off before the material approval began. Uh, so in a lot of cases, there can be a, an inventory system such as uh, we're going to do a full inventory every year without necessarily a material approval, system, uh, a material approval set in place. Um, so Joe, thanks for clarifying why that answer could have shown up in that sense. Um, but there is there are a lot of folks that I don't necessarily stop halfway, but they start with that visibility and don't ever end up getting a material approval set up, or when they do, it doesn't necessarily get adopted. Uh, just on that note, another customer management item, uh, especially if you're using SiteHawk, we do run material approval workshops. Uh, so someone like myself coming out to, to take questions and bring the stakeholders in the room, figuring out what we need to know, and also figuring out the appetite of the material approval entry users to try and figure out what's best. So reach out to us for that if you're interested. Thanks for the comment, Joe. Okay, um, I have a question from uh, Ray. He asked, can you provide 
examples of healthcare organizations that are using this system to enable management to take action on implementing this type of system? So for Ray, um, just specific examples, I'm probably I'm not going to kind of na name drop in general, uh, but we have a use case paper coming out that addresses this exact question from a, from more of a healthcare research type of firm. So we'll be able to pass that on. Um, I'm going to leave this one at that for the moment, um, but we'll put that on a follow-up list, and the same list will basically be be able to access that. And that's going to be pushed out by Verdantix, I think, in the next month and a half. Um, then with your question, so it's enabling management to take action on this type of system, so that portion of your question, I would come back to the, um, I had one of those beginning slides about the climate for management buy-in, um, framing the system as a more of a competitive advantage as opposed to just a cost center and how you can do things like consolidate vendors and you can do things like tie chemical data into your other type of systems, especially in healthcare where chemicals are so important. Uh, you could quickly speak around your organization, find stakeholders that might be in different areas than you are, and collect a group that has the same interests that help you really develop a little more compelling case for that. And I'm also making some assumptions on your question. If you want to follow up with an email or a call, I'd be happy to um, dive a little deeper. Hopefully that, hopefully that helped, though. It looks like we have a, a couple minutes left here. Um, and yes, is... Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, is it David Wilson? Is that our next question here? Yes. Um, David, David asks, uh, do the changes to Prop 65 require us to obtain new SDSs from vendors? So, perfect. So, Dave, David Wilson with the Prop 65. So, I'll be totally frank, David. I know that Prop 65 has changed and it's been a hot topic. Um, in our system in particular, we have updated um, to include the changes to Prop 65 and the, the regulatory data at the very minimum. But I have not yet gone, to it, gone through it enough to provide a conclusive answer. Um, however, what I will say is under Section 15, within the SDS for those vendors, they are required to consider in the regulation section what the effects of Prop 65 are to their product, and that might require them to make changes. So I would expect a lot of them to release uh, another revision for that. Uh, but this is one that I can, I can certainly follow up on with uh, our regulatory specialists downstairs. Uh, thanks for that question. I'll make sure we get back to you. All right, uh, Matt, it looks like we're just about out of time. Um, uh, I think, uh, thank you for, for a great presentation today. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions. If we didn't get to your question, I'm sure Matt would be, uh, uh, be willing to uh, respond back to you over email. Um, my thanks to Sighthawk for sponsoring today's webinar and to all, all of our listeners uh, for attending today. Uh, please be on the lookout for announcements of uh, other upcoming Synergist webinars.